<laughs> oh, who's up for it this morning? <laughs> oh my gosh, such a British crowd we have here. Excellent. Come on, we just did a uh, a faith thing. It's who we are. Like, yeah, it's who we are. It's what we do. We we don't just rock up at church to hear nice ideas. We come to hear truth, hopefully, if you go to a good church anyways. <laughs> you, you come to sit under the ministry of God's Word, not to feel good or that you've ticked a box or that you've done a religious duty, but because we believe that the local church is the hope of the world, that God is wanting to reach the broken, the lost, through this people, the church, the bride of Christ. Amen? And so we are continuing in our series called The Orchard. By the way, I tried to angle the lights better today so you can see my mustache. I feel like I need to get more in the light. What do you reckon, guys? Out of 10? Kerry, what is that face for? She's just like, I'm not impressed by that effort. I'm actually totally surprised. I'm surprised that, A, something has developed there, for starters, because I am a blondie, but I'm also so surprised that it's not ginger. Caleb, you're grounded for a week because he keeps telling me I've got a ginger moustache. It's just not true, man. Get your eyes tested. Go to Specsavers. Um, so, yeah, but Louise is saying now I'm kind of committed to having it the whole summer because I've been in the sun this week. And if I was to shave it, she'd say I look like I've been drinking milk. Just like a little milk tash right here. Ah. Uh, Dear, oh dear. You know, it's funny, I've got this mic here when I'm in the band. Generally, I'm not a great singer, so I'm, you can't hear what I'm saying down this, but it's an MD mic. In other words, I'm directing the music in their ears, and I'm telling them what to do. And as uh, Joe was just talking about their dog and saying how the dog waits on the windowsill and just, like, eagerly waiting for their, like, owners to get home, and I was like, uh, I said to the band in the ears, I said, Louise is exactly the same when I go out. Waiting on the windowsill, eager for me to get back, lost without me, just not sure what to do. When she sees me, pulls up, doesn't know whether to stay at the window or charge at the door. She can't make up her mind. And we're all kind of laughing. And then Joe said, and when you get in, there's a little greeting, normally a lick in the ear. I said, Louise is exactly the same. <laughs> exactly the same. Oh, who's looking forward to the baptisms next week? Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be so good. I'm going to be down the beach. Just keep t checks on your uh, mail out because uh, we're aware that there's some roadworks down Sandbank, so we've got to look into the logistics. But hopefully it will be in the same place, but we, we will send out an email in the week just to confirm the location. But it will be 6 o'clock, and it's going to be great. And it's a good thing to come down and support people who are getting baptized as they make this faith declaration and put their confidence in Jesus publicly. It's an amazing thing, and it's so exciting. I was talking to Caleb this week because... Um, we were in the sea on, I can't remember when it was, took him down the beach after school one day. And I was like, you boys just don't stay in the sea long enough. I said, well, I'm in there. I'm in there for a good hour. And he says, yeah, but dad, you're from the Midlands, <laughs> is what he said. I'm like, good point. Whenever we see the beach, we have to go swimming. Anyways, today we are looking at the theme of joy. Yes, joy, joy. And so you'll notice in the uh, first couple of songs today, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. There's joy in the house of the Lord. And also, nothing's going to steal my joy. Joy is such a powerful force and so integral to your witness as Christians. I think sometimes we downplay the role of joy in the Christian's life. And so... If I could rename my sermon, I can't because I've already called it something for small group. But I liked a word that Louise said yesterday, which was joyology. And that's what this message would be called. Because what I want to do is I want to give you knowledge on joy. Um, in Proverbs 29, you've probably heard this uh, verse quoted, where there is no vision, people perish. Another translation, or the word for vision there, also speaks of revelation or knowledge. Okay, so it's an interesting thing to consider when we're not just talking about vision as a future reality, like a picture we're uncovering to the church, but rather people perish when they have a lack of knowledge. Knowledge is a powerful thing. God gave you a brain. Do you believe that? 
<laughs> Not enough of you. I don't, uh, st- the, the jury's out. I'm still working it out. All right, turn to the neighbor next to you and say, you've got a brain. And then turn to the one the other side and say, you've got an even bigger brain. You know, being a Christian doesn't mean you leave your brain and your mental faculties at the door. Actually, God wants you to use your brain. God wants you to use your intellect. And it doesn't matter if you're super clever or super bright, because we are in the faith business. So actually, it's about receiving knowledge, but understanding that the greatest economy when it comes to the Christian walk is applying faith. It's about having faith to believe what God is saying. But sometimes we need help understanding things that are in the Word of God. And I think when it comes to joy, we undersell joy and misunderstand joy. And so I've come up with a thought on joy that I want to tell you, and a little soundbite that I've written, but I think it kind of hopefully speaks to everything that I'm going to unpack over the next four hours. So listen, this is it. Joy is a state of being that speaks to your confidence, contentment, and countenance. I'll say that again. Joy is a state of being that speaks to your confidence, lack of confidence in the world right now, contentment, a lack of contentment in the world right now, and countenance. In other words, the way that you hold yourself, the atmosphere you carry. And then I go on to say this. It is not happiness. Everybody say that with me. It is not happiness, although happiness can be a manifestation of joy. So it's really important to just decipher those two ideas. Joy is not happiness, but happiness can be a manifestation of joy. Joy can make you happy, but if you think joy is just happiness, someone's missold you PPI, and I'm here to correct that sales pitch this morning. Happiness, if you're making notes, it's a good thing to capture. Happiness is to do with happenings. Happiness is to do with happenings. In other words, circumstances. Joy is deeper. Here's an example. If you win a thousand pound this afternoon, you can be happy. If you lose a thousand pound this afternoon, you can be joyful. You see what I'm saying? If you win a million pound, let's up the ante here, because some of you are so low, you're like, a thousand pound, that's nothing to me, man. Not. Uh, A million pound, I can be happy, but what if I lose everything? Well, I can still be joyful, because my joy is not dependent on my circumstances and my happenings, okay? And we are going to get deeper and deeper, so if you're making notes, it's a good thing to kind of capture them, because you need to go home and really see if I'm telling you the truth or not. In the New Testament... When we see the word joy, the word that is there in Greek is kara. Everybody say kara. Kara comes from the term charismatic or charis. It speaks to a grace gift. So when you see the word joy in the New Testament, so the reason we're talking on joy today is because we're in the series on the orchard, and it's the second part of the fruit of the Spirit. So we see that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, okay? And we're going to work through them. In the New Testament, when we see that word joy, it's kara okay, which speaks to grace. It's a gift, something you can't earn, something you can't buy. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit, not like tongues and prophecy. It is a feeling. It's an inner reality. It's a posture. It's a countenance that is a work of God. It is kara. It's a gift, amen? But if that's all I was to tell you about joy, I would be not helping you out. Because in the Old Testament, the word for joy in Hebrew is chedva. Everybody say chedva. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. But chedva means this, my intentional response to what's going on. Isn't that interesting? So in the Psalms, it's used for the word gladness. It's used for the word joy. So it speaks to my intentional, thank you, speaks to my intentional decision to be joyful even though it's irrational and unreasonable. Are you tracking with me? Are you tracking with me? All right, let's start again. What is joy? No, I'm joking. I'm not going to do that. But next time I say you're tracking, even if you're not going to go, oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. 
Joy in the New Testament, kara, means grace, gift. Joy in the Old Testament means my intentional response. Okay, so the message title for this morning is Grace and Grit. Grace and Grit, and you'll see why. A biblical definition of joy is this. Joy is a feeling of good pleasure and happiness that is dependent on who Jesus is rather than on who we are or what is happening around us. Here's another biblical definition. But when I say biblical definition, I mean scholars who have cooked this this idea down. It is a perpetual gladness of the heart that comes from knowing, experiencing, and trusting Jesus. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a brilliant preacher back in the day, and good friends with my granddad, just to name drop that, said this, Joy is the response and the reaction of the soul to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So the intentional response isn't a, I'm going to just choose to be joyful, but it's as I know Jesus, being joyful is so much easier. Joy is beyond the moment. It stands on the past. In other words, the faithfulness of God, it looks behind us, but it also speaks to the future, trusting in what God will do through us and in us. Hebrews 12, verse 2, I'm not sure if it's going to come up or not. Hebrews 12, verse 2, says about Jesus, For the joy, Kara, set before him, he endured grit. He endured the cross, scorning its shame. So on the one hand, was Jesus enjoying going to the cross? I don't think so. Was Jesus really excited about dying? I don't think so. In fact, we see in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out to the Lord, his father. He's like, Lord, if there's another way, take this cup from me, but not my will be done, but your will be done. In other words, he resolved in grit to endure the pain of the cross for the joy that was set before him. Grace and grit. Let me tell you now why joy is important to the Christian. I'm going to give you three reasons why joy is important to the Christian. Like I say, this is a lecture on joy. It's a it's a joyology seminar, okay? So the first reason it's important to be joyful, we are commanded to be joyful. We're commanded to be joyful. God's first covenant people, Israel, like literally hundreds of verses, hundreds of verses, but here's some. Psalm 149 verse 2, let Israel be glad, chedva, in other words, joyful, in his maker, let the children of Zion rejoice Rejoice, coming from the word for joy, in their king. In other words, speaks to their response. Psalm 14, verse 7. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Intentional decision to be glad. Psalm 97, verse 12. Rejoice in the Lord always. Psalm 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness, chedfa, joy. You don't always feel happy about serving. It's a decision on the basis of your relationship with Jesus, to choose joy and gladness. If you still don't believe me, Psalm 32, verse 11. Be glad in the Lord. Be chedva in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Literally hundreds of references in the Old Testament, but it doesn't stop there. In the New Testament, Jesus says this. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. That word there is kairo, which is a reaction you choose. In Luke 10, 20, Jesus says, Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Paul says, if you want to hear some Pauline theology, I always think it's weird that when you say Paul theology, you say Pauline and it sounds like Pauline. It just seems weird, doesn't it? Because when I hear the name Pauline, I think of like a dinner lady. Anyone else? No, just me. Pauline theology. Like, well, I was thinking about Jesus the other day. Right. Paul says, you're going to have to bear with me. This is how my mind works. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, rejoice always. And then you get to Philippians, which is just a book of joy. It's a tidal wave of joy coming from Paul. Be glad and rejoice with me. Let me just give you the context. Paul in prison awaiting execution. Be glad and rejoice with me. He's got nothing to rejoice about, really. Some of us determine to have a bad day when petrol goes up another 2p, a litre. 
some of us have a bad day when our hot tub is sub-optimum degree temperature. Some of us have a bad day when you accidentally flip a curb and split open your tire and get late to a prayer meeting. I did that a couple of weeks ago. Some of us resolve to have a bad day when you have a difficult exchange with your spouse and you're hacked off with one another. Some of us resolve to have a bad day when the children don't wake up like the Von Trapps and walk out the room going, do away me, faso Latina. Right? You know, we resolve to have a bad day. Paul, in prison, awaiting really the outcome of his trial, which leads to execution, probably between one month and two years from the point of writing this, Paul says, be glad and rejoice with me. This is mental. Philippians 3 verse 1, another one in that same letter. Rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say, rejoice. Like, hopefully you can see that this command and instruction to be joyful is not an optional invitation. Like God is in heaven saying, listen, if you can really muster, it'd be nice if you could smile today. Now, now I'm not belittling the challenges and the hardships you faced or you're facing. I spoke a lot about this on Christians Anonymous. But actually, when it comes to joy, it's so much beyond a feeling, so much deeper than a feeling. For sure, you don't have to be happy, but you are instructed to be joyful in all things. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. In fact, What's really interesting, just go with me here. I've got to watch the clock carefully. Are you kidding me? Really carefully, right. 2 Corinthians 6, this is absolutely crazy. Don't you hate it when the books in the Bible move location and you can't find them? Mine always does that. Just tucks itself somewhere else. I was like, when was Corinthians put there? Right, 2 Corinthians 6. Here we go. I'll just say really quick, this is Paul's hardships. We put no stumbling block, so 2 Corinthians 6, verse 3. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. Through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed. Verse 10, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Isn't that interesting? Grit and grace. Your circumstances are not irrelevant to God but they are irrelevant to the instruction, which is to be joyful. To be joyful. Okay, so why should we be joyful? Because we're told to be joyful. Why else? Listen to this. It makes you strong. It makes you strong. It is not a fickle emotion. It's a firm foundation. In the book of Nehemiah, the people have just a mic drop moment with God and they become aware of their brokenness and sinfulness before their father God, Jehovah. They have this moment of, oh my gosh, we are total losers. What's the point? We may as well give up. But Nehemiah stands before them in 8 verse 10 and says, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength strength. Your strength in life is undergirded by your measure of joy. Despair, listen to this, despair, which you can also choose, makes you weary, tires you out, but joy brings strength. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. As we reflect and look back on the last couple of years of crazy, crazy, that's what I call COVID now, crazy, crazy, Um, and you look back and you go, what on earth has been happening? Everything has been decimated. I can choose despair, which gets me weary because I get overtaken by the emotions of hopelessness, or I choose joy 
I choose joy. I'm not waiting for a feeling to catch me up and go, oh, I just feel so great about the crappiness of society right now. I feel wonderful. It's not that. It's like, Lord, you are good. My soul will be glad in you. I rejoice in my maker. I find joy in you, regardless of what happens to the world. Just as Paul said, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I'm sad about it, but I'm still going to rejoice. Joy makes you strong. Why else is joy important? Because, if you're making notes, you can't have hope without joy. Let me read Romans 15, verse 13. I don't know if these scriptures are coming up or not. They are great. Well done, Wilf. Give Wilf a round of applause. He's smashing it today. Richard is absent, but Wilf is stepping up, and Wilf's even grown a beard this week to try and copy Richard and emulate Richard. So well done. But listen, Romans 15, 13, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I know some of you aren't going to receive that because it, it, it's muddy in your mind. But if you can, just try and unclutter your mind for a moment to hear what Paul is saying. May the God of hope fill you, fill the word grace is kara, you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What's key to your hope? Joy and peace. We'll talk about peace next week. But joy is a key ingredient to hope. If you're feeling hopeless this morning, start with joy. Start with joy. Okay, now here's the question, how do I get it? Because hopefully now you want it, okay? How do you get it? I'm going to tell you the first thing you do is you be filled with the Holy Spirit. Week one of this series, I spoke a little while on the need to be filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit. But this is fruit of the Spirit. In other words, when we come to Galatians 5 and we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and probably something else, faithfulness. I don't know what else I've missed. But when you come to these nine aspects of the fruit, the point is not to pursue the fruit. The point is to pursue the root. The point is, I don't want to become more joyful. The point is, I want more of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be gooder, as they say in the Midlands. I just want to be gooder. You're badder, I'm gooder. Um, you know, you don't want to just be good. You don't just want to, like, pursue self-control. What you want to pursue is the Holy Spirit, which is why in our worship times, we're trying to create that awkward space because what we need is more of the Holy Spirit. Like, we don't just need a people who are more patient. That's cool. We need a people who are filled and led and activated by the Holy Spirit. So you're not pursuing the fruit. You're going after the root. You're really going after the Holy Spirit. We must be obsessed with the Holy Spirit. We must be spirit-filled, spirit-activated, spirit-led. These kind of churches produce the best disciples. So it's just the truth. It's the truth. Disciples who produce fruit in all seasons, even in seasons of economic crisis. It, 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 there's no caveat it, it, it's not like you'll produce fruit in every season unless the government whacks some sanctions on and things get really tight. No, there is no caveat because God supersedes government. When you are godless, the best hope you've got for changing society is government. But when you have God, you know that the government is never going to change society. Why? Because government is filled with people. <laughs> and people generally have their own agendas. And they work to their own ends. But God, when you look to God, there's this sense that ultimately, even in times of crisis and economic strain, I'm going to produce fruit. So Holy Spirit is how you get it. Second thing you can do to get joy is obedience. Obedience. Who likes the word obedience? Yeah, I'm coming to love it too. It takes me a bit longer though to get there. John 15, verse 10 to 11. Listen to what Jesus says. If you keep my commands, 
you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that your joy, my joy, may be in you. And that your joy may be full. So I love this picture and idea that there are different measures and levels of joy. But it really is proportionate to your obedience. If you keep my commands. I think that's why Jesus in the Great Commission tells his disciples, teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Because obedience is the thing that moves the needle. What is obedience? It's obedience to God's word. Like, and if you're not reading the word, how can you know how you're to build your life? Christian community, by sitting in moments like this, hopefully you hear nuggets of truth that just land on you, maybe sometimes like a feather, maybe sometimes like a sledgehammer to the gut. But ultimately, in that moment, you feel like God challenging, challenging you in something. I had this like a few days ago. I really felt God just lodge something in my spirit, and I was fighting God with it because I didn't want to be obedient in that moment because I'm a human. Um, and like, but ultimately, Jesus says that keeping his commands, in other words, being obedience, is essential to you remaining in his love. I kind of think of it like this, that the best thing for children, if you're a parent and you've got children, especially on Father's Day, this one's free, the best thing you can give them is consistent boundaries. Consistent boundaries. My kids, although they kick against it at times, and my kids are cool. I, like, I love my kids. They're great. They're not, like, awful. They're great kids. But, like, boundaries, it secures them up to the point that they know they are loved. That's what speaks to their security and their, their, how they're being rounded as a person. Like, it's the parameters. Like, commands and instructions aren't there to deprive them of the fun. It's to lead them into the fullest version of life that is best for them and best for everyone around them. Obedience is an issue of love because sometimes you may not understand why God is saying this or why we see this in Scripture. But ultimately, as I obey and as I come into alignment with His instructions, I remain in His love. This is the pathway of his love. There are boundaries. Like I think of Louise playing bowling. The last couple of times, she, you've, you've beaten me, haven't you? And she celebrates it and she posts it on Instagram and all this kind of stuff. But what she never shows you is the mechanical things coming out the side of the alley. She always leaves that part of the story out because that's irrelevant to her claim of victory. So I'm throwing balls down this like 40-foot alleyway and they're going everywhere and then Louise gets up with like a six-pound ball or something. And I'm sitting there going, this just ain't fair, man. Because, like, I'm not guaranteed one skittle when I bowl, but she's guaranteed at least one. Because sometimes it's like slaloming all the way down. You've got a couple of strikes in your own way. That's how losers talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Luby. <laughs> but it's like these boundaries, what they do is they, they ensure you're going to win in life. So removing boundaries doesn't help us. Removing boundaries isn't like, oh, I'm so liberated now. I'm so liberated I can throw my ball down the gutter. Yes. It's like, no, this helps me live the life that will lead me to win. And obedience, like Jesus says, I have told you this so that joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Running out of time. So the final thing that you do to get joy is pursue the presence of God. So the, the difference here between the first point is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you, Ben. Don't tell me Richard's text you from Wales. He got word. Someone's text Richard and Richard say, Ben, get on the keys now. Seriously, he's dying up there. Right. <laughs> Psalm 1611, David says this, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with external pleasures at your right hand. Uh, another translation, in your presence is the fullness of joy. So the first point is this, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But this point is to do with this idea of pursuing the presence of God, practicing the presence of God. In our daily devotions, not just making time to speak to God, 
but actually to incline our ear towards heaven. So crucial, but we need to move on because we're going to land this plane in literally four minutes. Right. So let me tell you this. This bit's almost the most important bit, so it's annoying that we've got here now. How do you keep your joy? Right. How do you keep it? You praise. I've spoken about this before, so I'm not going to go into too much. You praise over pity. You praise over pity. As I said, hundreds of references in the Psalms to rejoice, to be glad. In Psalm 95 verse 1, David says this, Let us sing for joy to the Lord. I think generally how we normally interpret that verse is, let us come to God joyfully. But actually, if you break down the the verse in Hebrew, it's more like this, let us sing to the Lord for joy. In other words, I'm singing, I'm shouting for joy. I'm not coming joyful, but I'm posturing myself in praise to become joyful. Does that make sense? It's different. It's not like, because I understand, it's like, if you come in and you're like dancing, and you're just like, I will, like, I will. That's, that's a cool thing to do. I mean, I'm not saying don't do that, like, to not raise your hands out of discipline. That's awesome. But the sentiment in this, these verses that speak like this, let us sing for joy to the Lord, It's assuming that actually you're coming and you're praising to become joyful. You're not praising because you are joyful. You're coming into a moment and and you're kind of saying, I will worship with every breath. I will do it. I will shout to joy. I will shout to the Lord for joy. I will shout. I will scream. I will dance for joy. And I do it because as I, as I step out of my own comfort, as I step out of my own understanding, it becomes a faith issue where I'm convinced in faith that God is worthy of my praise even when my circumstances are rubbish. I'm convinced that God's name is still to be glorified and lifted up even if I'm feeling hard done by. So when I come into the presence of God, I shout for joy. God, you're amazing. God, you're so faithful. God, you're so good. And I'm so grateful for who you are and for what you've done. And in that moment, as I shout for joy to the Lord, there's a sense in me that my soul comes into alignment with the declaration of my tongue. So I praise over pity. The next thing is I choose contentment over comparison. Contentment over comparison. Compassion, um, sorry. Comparison is the fastest way to ruin something good. It's the fastest way to ruin something good. If you've just got a nice car, it's only nice until you compare it to someone who's got something better. Your contentment is shifted on the axis of comparison. Paul says this, I've known times of plenty and I've known times of lack, but I have learned the art of contentment. He says, and he says there's a secret of contentment, and the secret is is this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So, like, comparison. Comparison is evil in two ways. Comparison will cause you to either feel good about yourself at someone else's expense. Like, yeah, me and Louise, we drive a banger. And she insists on making it more of a banger on a regular basis by scratching as much of the paintwork as she possibly can, right? But at least we've got a car and we're not cycling like them. Okay, now I'm proud. Okay, that's a sin before God. So that comparison has led me to be inflated in my understanding of our predicament. Or I come and I park next to someone in the car park who's got like, let's say like a Something even nicer, like a 20-year-old Ford Galaxy. (laughs) And I look and I say, yeah, but that's a real seven-seater, unlike ours, that has these stupid chairs that fold out the boot. That that seven-seater has individual seating units. I mean, that's amazing. Now, all of a sudden, comparison has led me to be deflated. Both are wrong. I think this is why in the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, it says, do not cover your neighbor's donkey. 
And I just find that's such a funny word because it's almost like you're riding your donkey and you're happy in the Middle East. <laughs> you know, and, and as you're riding, you know, someone's got a donkey with a stripe down it. You know, and like they've got like one of those kits that are fitted onto it. You know, they've lowered it down a bit and they've put a spoiler on the <laughs> on the back of it. And now all of a sudden the donkey that I was enjoying riding yesterday is now a mule today because it's like oh, that donkey is way better. And that's what's hard when you try to teach the scripture without making it culturally relevant. But let's say cars instead, right? But I do like the idea of a donkey. Like <laughs> these donkeys that just look so ridiculous, don't they? But do you know, more um, donkeys are responsible for more deaths in the world than any other animal now. It used to be hippo, and now it's donkeys. So never play a donkey down. Never cuss a donkey out. And they've got big ears, so they might be listening to this right now. So apologies, donkeys, if you're listening. You're great. But I'm just loving my Wednesday on my donkey until on Thursday, I see Hezekiah's got an even better donkey than me. Oh, <laughs> that's a massive donkey. And it's not, oh, it's not. Anyways, move on. Right, contentment over comparison. And finally, this is how you keep your joy, repentance over resistance. Like, there's lots of things in this message that are at odds with modern culture. Things like contentment, <laughs> uh, things like obedience and repentance. Uh, Louise was talking to a person back along, not in this church, and encouraged them to repent of something, and they were offended. Like, ex- excuse me, what? What, you're saying I need to repent of that? O- almost like, yeah, because your repentance is heavenward. You're not repenting to me. You're repenting before God. And this person, it took them a while after they got past some of those kind of heavy texts that they sent back saying, like, this is out of order. Well, I'm sorry if we encourage you to say sorry to God when you're in the wrong. But repentance has always been popular in heaven. (laughs) Repentance speaks to acknowledging your broken and sinfulness acknowledging that you need help and coming to God and owning it and saying, God, I have messed up here. And not just speaking it, but resolving, deciding, I'm going to turn my back on that and go in a different direction. Repentance is a brilliant thing. Repentance is a necessary thing. We can talk about revival all day long at Sunny Hill, but unless we understand the role of repentance, revival is just a pipe dream. Because repentance is about saying, God, we're stuffed down here. Literally, what does it say in 2 Chronicles 7? It says, if my people who are called by my name, what does, it, what does it say? If my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways, turn from their wicked ways, and then God says, then I will hear their prayers and I will answer their prayers and I will feed the land. Like there's this sense of like repentance turns the ear of God, not resistance. Not like I'm too good for that thing, repentance. Repentance is a gift. It allows me to come and acknowledge my brokenness and just say, God, I'm struggling. Like seriously, Lord, I've messed up here. I've watched this. I've done that. I've said that. I've hurt this friendship, you know, before you. And and yes, I may have sinned against people, but as David says, against you and you alone have I sinned. The precedent for this in the scripture, Psalm 51, creating me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Repentance restores joy of salvation. It's saying that like Christians who are mature in faith still sin. It's not like you get to a point and you graduate church school and all of a sudden you're no, you're no longer like problematic and you don't make any mistakes. But the mature you are in faith, listen to this, means that the gap between sin and repentance gets shorter. When you're immature, you sin. You try and shake it off, dust it off, kind of talk it away and just try and ignore it or whatever. But as you grow in Jesus, you know what it's like to carry something that you were never built to carry. And so when you mess up, 
and you're a mature believer and you're trying to grow in your faith, the faster you can get to your knees, metaphorically, the faster you can come before God and say, God, I'll stuff this up. That's what maturity looks like. Not that you become perfect, but that you become quicker to repent. Repentance over resistance. So, how to keep your joy? Praise over pity. Contentment over comparison. Repentance over resistance. Amen? This week in small group, we're going to unpack that more. And um, I filmed it down the beach because I'm a Midlander and I was there. And I was like, I want to film the session down the beach today. Uh, But we're going to unpack this more. Because actually, it's all very well me trying to educate you and teach you in this moment and give you some things to consider, which is all great. But in your small group, it creates an opportunity through conversation to understand, well, how does this affect me at work tomorrow? How does this affect the way I raise my kids? How does this affect me in my relationships with my friends or employment and stuff like that? Like, understanding how joy gives legs to your faith is so crucial to our growth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And God, this morning, we acknowledge, Lord, that we are imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. And so, Father, we just say this morning, God, we're broken, we're dysfunctional, we're sinful, we need you. We need Jesus. We need Jesus, Lord. So, Father, help us to be a people who choose praise, who choose contentment, and who choose repentance. Give us the grace of joy. And give us the grit to endure through difficult times as we shout to the Lord for joy. God, you're a good God. We thank you for your kindness to us. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen.